Hello, my name is Hilary Davidson and I am a dress historian and today I want to talk about dress in the age of Jane Austen which is the subject of a book that I published last year with Yale University Press and that I was very fortunate to do a lot of the research for at Chawton House Library in 2015 with a fellowship that they had there and I wanted to look to reassess clothing and Jane in Jane Austen's work and in her life and look at how people actually used clothes in the Regency period because it's a it's a remarkable period of change. I take my period as as being sort of between the years 1795 and 1825, the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the early 19th century, much longer than the actual temporal Regency. And I wanted to do this because the Regency period is one that's familiar to a lot of people, mostly through the adaptations of Jane Austen. And the screen versions of Regency dress give us a certain view of um, the period. But what was it really like? Um, how did Jane Austen and her contemporaries use clothing in their daily life? Not just fashion, but aprons and cloaks and all of the, the ways that clothing helps us interact with our environment. And how might it have a different relationship to people's everyday lives than perhaps that shown um, on screen, which is always going to be a little bit romanticised and a little bit idealized. So that was the starting point for researching the book. Uh, I'll just sort of run through the quick dates of Jane Austen here, although I'm sure these are etched into the hearts of many people listening to this. But she's born in 1775 in Hampshire and she dies in 1817 in the same county. Um, she's buried in Winchester. And of course, she completes and publishes her six novels during the time, the, the six completed novels during the time that she lives at Chawton Cottage in Hampshire. Um, the her relationship to a Southern English uh, landscape and culture, I think, has also given us um, a different insight into clothing through her works. And I drew very heavily on her letters as well to look at how she understood clothing and used it um, in the correspondences with her sister Cassandra. And a more Northern writer like Elizabeth Gaskell later, or perhaps the Brontes, would have given us, I think, a different perspective into Regency dress. So my focus very much kept to Austen's um, more southerly locational spaces. But I also wanted to think about the Regency as a period in itself. Uh, another reason I wrote the book was that there was no good scholarly um, single volume introduction to Regency dress. And when I was researching it, I wanted to take it off the shelf and read it. Uh, it didn't exist, so I wrote it. But the Regency really changes from this kind of exaggerated, extended uh, 18th century silhouettes. And I feel it's the first period where we can kind of see ourselves in the figures. They're, they're more normal. They're kind of clothing straight up and down. It, it, it looks like something that we in the present day can imagine ourselves in. It's not quite so strange as the fashions that have just come before it. And the, one of the other advantages of using Austen as a starting point is that so much of, so much research has been done into her life and works that we can look at her not just as this kind of monumental singular author, but as the kind of core of a part of what is now the best biographized middling sorts family in the Georgian period, because we're still in the late Georgian period here. So Austen's extended family gives us an insight into how um, gentry people thought about and used clothes during this interesting period of transition from what historians call the early modern period into the modern period. And throughout, I was really digging for things that were intimate and unusual for the kind of the nitty gritty of clothing rather than the screen idealization. So I love this picture here of a woman wearing stays, uh, which is what the sporting underwear was called uh, at the time. At this point, corsets are coming in, but they're definitely a uh, French fashion and they mean more kind of uh, lightly unboned supportive underwear. So these kind of longer bodied stays were more typical of the Regency period and just behind you can see someone having a shower bath which I think is fantastic and then those of you who've seen the recent 2020 film of Emma will um, recognize that this pose is replicated in the film and it's a wonderful way of showing that Regency women didn't wear underpants so I also wanted to 
question some of the myths about the Regency period, about the naturalism that was so popular, um, and how they achieved naturalism through fakery. So things like wigs, um, it's quite obvious in women's dress. So you can see here a fashionable woman at her toilette with her hair ready to go on to go out for the evening. And I feel that this idea of um, the idea of natural fashion or sort of classical ideals so dominates the Regency that it distracts from the way that people are still using things like false hair and padding to make your calves look better or your bosom look better um, to achieve a fashionable look. But I also started seeing men's wigs in portraits as well, uh, in a way that it would have been much more obvious with the grey horsehair wigs of the 18th century. But they're still wearing them throughout the Regency period. So I was interested in changing ways of seeing in that sense. And also thinking about, you know, the warmth that wigs provided and looking at what's behind the, uh, what, what images are apparently telling us. Another thing I was very concerned about was reconsidering the role of sewing in Regency women's lives. And first of all, it did contribute a lot to the making of clothing, but how important it was for the social lives of women and how the work that is done in drawing rooms um, and in private spaces really contributed to connecting people both in the social act of sewing, but also in the making of small gifts that reinforced acquaintance networks and um, helped kind of shape bonds of love and connection and respect through material things. Sewing often gets quite a bad rap in um, the views of history, that it's a drudgery, that it's an obligation, that it's something that's sort of chaining women to um, the, the drawing room. But Jane Austen herself, I think, is an example of how sewing could work mutually with the creative act. So this is a needle case that she made that she painted for um, a relative. This is one of Austen's manuscripts and this is her incredibly accomplished and fine uh, satin stitch which is on a handkerchief she made for her sister Cassandra, you can see the initials, that's held in the Jane Austen House Museum. And across the board here we can see a fineness and delicacy and precision of hand. How she does one thing is how she does everything. And as well there's records of one of her nieces remembering um, Austen working by the fire, which in this point uh, always means sewing suddenly laughing to herself, getting up and writing something down. So I wanted to think about how sewing could perhaps be a meditative and reflective act that, in, that aided Austen's creativity rather than being this thing that, you know, got in the way. Um, so that's, that's something that's been a pleasure to look at throughout. One of the great joys of my research, uh, one of the, the possibly the best research find was this picture in the background, which is held at Chawton House Library, and it's the account book of an unknown woman who some detective work revealed to be a Mrs. Mary Topham, a wealthy widow who lived in London. And Mrs. Topham's account book gave a wonderful account of all of these little sort of daily purchases of clothing. She's got a pattern net, net shirt, two pairs of black walking shoes, some yardage of green ribbon and this sense of daily shopping and how women acquired the, um, the accessories and necessary objects of clothing and what their spending patterns were. This research at Chawton was absolutely essential for kind of opening up the world of female Regency consumption. And it really got me interested in looking at the role of haberdashery in Regency clothing. We kind of we can look at art images like this. I love this woman because she's got so many um, different textile details on her. We can look at them as kind of uh, manifestations of style, but for Regency shoppers, their understanding of clothing was very much based in the material experience. So all of these tassels and cords and fringes and chenille and applied bands and ribbons and buckles, they all had a monetary value that they could see invested in clothing, but they were sort of like extras that got put onto um, the foundation of dress. And a lot of the shopping and a lot of the work of fashion is done through accessorizing and haberdashery like this. So looking at account books changed the way that I saw pictures and understood how they would have read fashion from other people's clothing as well. I'm interested in how fashion is transmitted. A lot of Austen's letters are talking about caps and how they, she makes caps for herself, for her friends, and how fashion was often uh, more mobile in accessories at the edges of the body. So lovely bonnets, small caps here, uh, gowns didn't move as fast, but you could always, you know, change a hat like Lydia Bennett uh, famously does in 
Pride and Prejudice. So then if you, you know, you see other people's hats, you send them across the country, fashion is being transmitted through objects and through physical garments as well. Another thing I was really seeking for the way, ways of seeing uh, Regency fashion is how they understood different styles. What was stylish at the time? What was uh, vulgar? So this is a wonderful image whose captions I seem to have cut off. I'm sorry, it's called L'Empreur Mutuel, the mutual loan. And the captions tell us in French that this is English girls dressed in the French style. And this is uh, French girls in the styles of the English. And to us, they might just look like girls in Regency white dress. But at the time, this very much clearly said something about the stances, the positions of both nations, uh, the stylistic differences between them. What did it mean when someone brought something over in the newest Parisian fashion to London and then distributed it out amongst her friends in, you know, Hampshire or Dorset? So trying to sort of understand the notions of style at the time, um, it was very, very interesting to sort of to see what their ideas of taste and elegance, to use Austen's word, were. And ladies like this pair of very elegant young English women do evoke um, that sense of elegance. I think it's, it's Austen's sort of favourite word of approbation, and we can use it, sort of understand that as taste, to be appropriate appropriately dressed, not too vulgar, uh, for the right time of day, for the position that, that one is in. And because Regency people had to kind of choose and design their own clothing more, it had to be made up, they chose the fabric, um, they had to think about every aspect of it rather than buying ready-made. The notion of taste and elegance was one that was more self-created. And to be naturally elegant, as uh, say Jane Fairfax is in Emma, as a counterpoint to the quite vulgar Mrs. Elton, was not just a matter of person, but of how one appropriately attired one's person. And it could go uh, wrong as well. I'm, I'm interested in how fashion works on real bodies. So you get wonderful pictures like these uh, drawings of city figures by Richard Dighton in the 1810s. And you can see how this great coat is straining across the gentleman's belly, how a shorter man, his coat sits much longer down at the calves than it might do. And the idea of sort of the fashionable ideal, but how that works on in clothing and in fit. I'm very interested in the, in those kind of aspects um, about the, yeah the difference between the real and the ideal, as well as the incredible uh, crisp details of Regency tailoring, uh, which is really one of the hallmarks of the period in menswear is is incredible developments in tailoring throughout. I have given lots of talks on Regency dress in the period building up to the publication of the book. So I was able to incorporate a lot of the questions that people had that I found being, I myself being asked again and again about Regency women's dress. And one of the biggest ones was how did women keep warm? Because I think a side effect of the um, costume drama approach to Regency dress is that it, it's a lot of muslin and it's usually filmed in good weather. So the idea of what to do in sort of the middle of winter in damp, cold England is not so often represented. But women had a lot of choices. Uh, they could wear riding habits. This is one from 1795, so the slightly earlier end of the Regency. Woolen dresses and uh, jackets that kept you warm while on a horse, but also while travelling. They had a whole range of uh, pelisses and uh, coats and fur tippets and shawls and mantles that would uh, they could pile onto themselves until, as Mariah Edgeworth said, she was warm as a dormouse one November day in an open cottage. But one of my greatest delights in discovery was how often people are wearing flannel underwear underneath their clothing. Uh, and this is like the Georgian equivalent of thermal underwear. And the more you look into it, the more you realise just how much of these kind of warming underlayers are going on under seemingly um, lighter clothing. So this is a wonderful image of uh, Dr. Flannel, who is offering uh, a lady um, a warm flannel petticoat for her loins. And she protests that I have no loins, fellow. She's horrified by the possibility of this very inelegant garment. But these kind of flannel uh, 
it's, it's always wool at this point, wool flannel um, shirts or waistcoats as they're called. Colonel Brandon famously wears one in uh, Sense and Sensibility. They are going underneath the clothing to keep people warm, both men and women. This is a Spencer, which is a short jacket, uh, one of the hallmarks of Regency women's dress. And there's been a lot of discussion about where the name came from. It's generally attributed to one of the members of the Spencer family, either George, uh, Duke of Marlborough, or his brother Charles. And I seem to have been able to attribute it as a fashion introduced by his brother Charles. But what's wonderful about that is that Charles was the captain of the Oxfordshire militia in which Jane Austen's brother Henry was a member um, and they were very good friends. So the man who invented one of the iconic garments of the Regency was besties with the brother of a woman who is you know, the iconic author of the Regency. And it's kind of delving into clothing myths like that that um, gave me such pleasure during the research. So other trends uh, and how they started, you can pin the Regency kind of a lot of its fashion making down to specific points. So these Cossack trousers, which are an invention of the 1810s, are uh, specifically associated with the visit of the Cossack troops with the, um, the Tsar of all the Russias in 1814 after the first defeat of Napoleon before he came back and is... Um, finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. So these fuller trousers with pleats and then with the straps underneath, you can see how they relate to uh, genuine Russian Cossack trousers as sketched here from the life in July 1814. The importance of the Navy is has been noted a lot in Austen's book. And of course, she had two brothers in the Navy, uh, Frank older than her and Charles the youngest. But the idea of how people traveled and how fashion moved around and what access people had to clothes and ideas from um, around the world, I think is very important to me to emphasize because Austen is so often considered this kind of cloistered rural person who you know she never left the country she she traveled through 14 different counties in her life but there's been in scholarship of, of previous years an idea of Austen as sheltered but her brothers went extraordinary distances and um, Charles married a woman from Bermuda he lived in Halifax uh, Frank went to all the way out to India and China and so this idea of the Regency Regency fashion being part of world fashion uh, is very important for me to bring out especially in the last chapter on the world and Indian muslin which of course is the underpinning of our concepts of Regency dress the little white dress as it were the muslin gown is inherently foreign. It relies on Indian imports and in fact um, competition with the finer Indian cloths, especially through the 1790s and 1800s, is one of the giant spurs of the Industrial Revolution in Britain to make British manufactured muslins as good as or better than Indian muslins and that thus capture a larger market share. So this kind of the relationship between fashion and technology and new technologies like net lace making uh, sorry lace making machines and net machines they have an impact um, so this is a, a dress from the 1810s and you can see how it's showing this beautiful silk lining underneath uh, underneath lace dresses they often wore slips as they're called of different colors to change the effect and this is also a lovely thing that's shown in the 2020 Emma where she wears different colored slips under muslin gowns and changes the outer color but so there's a lot of fashion innovation coming through especially in the 1810s but it is grounded in technology Another aspect that I greatly enjoyed finding out about was just how much re respectable gentry, middle class people smuggled. And that includes the Austens. So while, during this period of, of war, when um, various goods were less accessible at, at various times through reciprocal trade embargoes between Britain and um, Napoleon's growing empire, you have all of these kind of respectable tactics for avoiding customs duty. And this is a wonderful quote from uh, Fanny Palmer Austin, Charles's wife, about how because they're living on a ship they just uh, intercept packages before they come in and take them onto the ship so that the customs men have nothing to do with them. And I take quite a bit of glee in thinking about the Austin smuggling in that sense. And just to kind of give you a sense as well of uh, the extent to which they're doing it, this is the Red Line Tracks, um, a fabric that, as far as I can tell, Frank Austin distributed 
literally halfway around the world. Um, he bought, got some China crepe in China, and then he was uh, sailing back through India, accompanying an envoy of East India merchantmen. He comes home and Austin, uh, Jane Austen talks about having China crepe dresses after this period. So it looks like he gave some to his sisters. And then he's also, Fanny Palmer's letters record him sending her some, sending it over the Atlantic to Halifax as a present. So one Austen man can take a textile halfway around the world and spread it among his family on two different continents. And I think that just opens up a whole new world of Regency dressing. So I'm just going to finish up there. Um, this is sort of a whirlwind tour through the world of uh, dress in the age of Jane Austen. But I'm going to end on one of my favourite pictures of this period, which is Relinda Sharple's A Ball at the Clifton Assembly, of, painted in 1817. And it's full of all these remarkable little details of clothing. So a chapeau bra hat held underneath the arm of a man who's wearing York tan gloves. This fantastically... Um, pretty hessian boots with gilt silver tops and a red heel the turbans and the fans and the caps that are involved and so throughout um, the research process this has changed my perspective on how regency people read clothes and i feel i've got a better insight into the complex identities and financial and social and cultural worlds that clothing represented and it's about learning how to reread fashion like part of the joy of Austen is rereading her and finding more and more in it each time. So I hope that this has given you um, a taster for some of the ways in which Austen and her um, milieu experienced clothing. And if you'd like to read more, please do uh, have a look at my book, Dress in the Age of Jane Austen. Thank you so much.